hopefully you can join us for that as well. Well, Zephaniah chapter 2, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this evening and just uh, bringing us all here together, Lord, to study your word, to hear from you, Lord. We know that you desire to speak to us tonight. Um, you desire that we'd be more like you, and you've given us your Holy Spirit and your word to do that thing. So, Lord, whatever we need to hear tonight, whether it be encouragement or exhortation or conviction, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, and we'd be listening Lord, and we would let the word do its work and um, we would bear fruit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Zephaniah chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. We went over verses 1 through 3 last time, um, but I think it's a good place to, st it was a good place to stop last time and it's a good place to start this time. So verse 1 of chapter 2, Zephaniah the prophet says, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now I think this, these verses, as we talked about last time, it's talking about repentance. Uh, Zephaniah is telling the people who he's just pronounced judgment on, he's saying, hey, you know what? You have a chance right now. The Lord is, yes, he's announced judgment, and he's going to continue to announce judgment. But one thing we've seen, and one thing we see here, is that the Lord desires that people would repent. He doesn't desire to pour out his wrath on people. He didn't make us so he could destroy us. He created us so that way we would live life with purpose. And it's when we decide to go out of, outside of that purpose with our sin, because God is just and holy and righteous, he has to punish that. Now, again though, he always warns. One thing that's beautiful about the Lord, he always warns us. He's never one of the, I don't know if uh, maybe, maybe as a parent you've done this or maybe your parents did this to you where you can kind of see that your, your kid's getting in trouble and instead of warning them, you say, you know what, I'm going to let them, I'm going to teach them a lesson. I'm going to let them hit their head on the table there so that way they'll learn the lesson not to be running around the house or I'll let them do this or do that to learn their lesson not to do this. Well, I'm not going to say that's good or bad parenting, although probably not the best at times. But the Lord doesn't treat us that way. The Lord doesn't let us just walk into sin without warning us. Walk into judgment without warning us. The Lord doesn't just show up and say, all right, I'm giving you a spanking. What did I do? Well, you know what you did. You know, there's an uh, ancient, apparently an ancient Chinese proverb that says, um, spank your child every day, even if you don't know what they did wrong, they do. <laughs> well, the Lord doesn't do that. <laughs> the Lord knows exactly what we've done wrong, um, and he always tells us, and he always warns us. He never desires to punish us, but if we choose to harden our hearts like Pharaoh did, like many do, Paul says Romans, they suppress the truth. If we do that, then he will punish, but here, as Zephaniah says, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. You know, the prophets knew this about the Lord. They're declaring their message of hope, of, of destruction, sometimes of hope, sometimes of peace. A lot of times, though, of destruction, right? And instead, and instead of just saying, well, it's over for you guys, they knew the attribute of the Lord, that he was merciful. In fact, in the book of Jonah, we, we find that out about um, the prophet Jonah. He knew of the Lord's mercy, but in, in his eyes, that wasn't a good thing. When he went into the land of Nineveh and he's preaching repent, and they do, and the Lord doesn't destroy them, he tells the Lord, I knew it. I called it. I knew you would do that, Lord. That's why I didn't, he goes, that's why I didn't want to preach repentance because I knew that you're merciful and that you wouldn't pour destruction on them even though they deserve it. 
Now for Jonah, that caused him, God's mercy caused him to be reluctant to share the message of, of God. But for us, we should also understand the mercy of God. And instead of making us reluctant to share, it should burn a fire in our bones to want to share even more. Knowing that the Lord wants to save, you know, save that person. Ah, maybe, you know, I don't know if my neighbor really wants to hear that. I, I can tell you this, God wants to save them. I just don't know if my coworkers really want to be bothered with that kind of thing. I can tell you this, God wants to save them. Our reluctancy to share repentance puts us in the same lane as Jonah, where we care more about material things, right? And God showed Jonah that. He said, you care more about this plant that I caused to grow to give you shade and then I killed than you do about all these people down here. And what's one of the main reasons we don't want to share the gospel with people? It's embarrassing, our pride. If I share it at my job, they'll think I'm that weird Christian guy, right? It's our pride. It's or material things, and and I and if I and or I'm up for a promotion, and I don't, I certainly don't want to like start sharing my faith, and then like well we don't want to promote this guy because he's causing trouble by sharing the gospel. Then I can't get that new car I promised my wife. We can't do this. We can't do that. But see, we should understand the mercy of God, and it should cause us to want to share. So we have this here. And, and this, these verses, again, we ended with these verses last time, but I think it's great we start with them because with what we're about to read in the rest of this section, um, in chapter 2 at least, um, there's a lot of destruction coming. And we need to remember the context, that the, the context that the Lord is always desiring that people would repent. And if they do, He is merciful he is just, and he will. For, if we confess our sins to him, he is merciful and just to forgive us of our sins. John says. So, verse four: For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites! The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. Now, one thing to take notice of as we read this section is the times the Lord says there's going to be no inhabitants, I'm going to utterly destroy you, you know, that the, um, there's going to be utter desolation, the beasts are going to make, you know, ter- turn your cities into their place. Um, it, just uh, take note of that as we read this, verse 6. The seacoast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. In the houses of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah overrun with weeds and salt pits in a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them. He will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship Him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north. Destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation. As dry as the wilderness, the herd shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge in the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes her shall hiss and shake his fist. Now in 2 Thessalonians 1, which we just studied on Sunday, we see that Paul tells the church that 
It is God's righteous judgment that he will avenge the believers against the people that have been persecuting them. Paul tells them in 2 Thessalonians 1 that God sees their persecutions, their trials, their tribulations, and that God will come and put forth judgment on those people that are doing that to them. And Paul says this is righteous judgment. This is God's righteousness. And God is saying the same thing here to his people, Israel, about the surrounding nations. And when you read the history of Israel, you see that they were constantly at war. They were constantly being, you know, whether it was a whole nation attacking them or just bands of raiders coming in. I mean, from he mentions here Ethiopia, Assyria, the Philistines, and he mentions a bunch of cities and they are Moab, Ammon. Now what's interesting is with a lot of these nations, these nations don't exist anymore. How many of us know an Ammonite or a Moabite? Or a Philistine? Notice what he says even about Moab. Surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation there in verse 9. Perpetual desolation. Now one thing I think that is certain when we read about the, what the Lord is saying here, one thing is certain is that the Lord will always protect His people. The Lord sees what his people goes through. And I, and I think what's also interesting to note is you have to understand what the Lord is saying here to those who aren't part of his nation, but also notice what he's saying to people who are in the nation of Israel. He says in, at the end of verse 9, the residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Now we know that Israel will be judged for their sins. But one thing the Lord never does with his own people is he never destroys them completely. There's always a remnant. There's always a leftover, right? God always has people who are serving him. And that's not because of the people. The Israelites did nothing to not be completely destroyed. It wasn't like, well, you know, I can't completely destroy them. I mean, look at them. They're great people. No, it's all because of God's own faithfulness. God promised that he would never completely destroy them. God made a promise to Abraham that he wouldn't completely destroy his, his family. And he's continued that promise even today. I mean, think about the Israelites. We know in the Bible they were taken captive and sent to Babylon. And yet, we see in Nehemiah and, and even through Ezekiel that they come back and they rebuild the city and they rebuild the nation. I mean, it's crazy how, how many countries have, or nations have done that. And then not only that, but then we know they come in and get overtaken by the, uh, the Greeks and Romans. Then the dispersion, the diaspora, and they're sent all over the world, really. But then what happened in this last century? The nation was reborn again. As its own nation. Not just a people group that identified as a certain, you know, cultural or culture or ethnicity. But they actually had, they were a, they're a recognized nation. How many other nations have done that? None. Either they're really lucky <laughs> or God's word is true. And, and uh, you know, there's some, some Christians who, who think, why do we even study? Why do we worry about Israel? Aren't we all part of God's family now as Christians? And, and yet, yes, it's true. There, there's neither, neither Greek uh, or uh, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, female, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. But... The church has not replaced Israel. 
If the church were to replace Israel, that means God was through with Israel. And if God's through with Israel, then his promise is not true. We as believers should look at the faithfulness of God to Israel and say, that's the same God that I serve. And he has that same faithfulness towards me. Not because I deserve anything. I mean, he tells that to Israel all the time. I didn't choose you because you were anything great. In fact, you were like the least of the nations and I chose you. Because throughout Israel's history, they got pretty haughty and thought of themselves, we're, we're Israel. I mean, we have God, Jehovah. We must be something special. And God says, that's not the case. You're not special. I'm special. <laughs> and I've chosen you. But what we can see here is that God sees his people. He takes care of his people. He protects his people. In verse 10, he says, This they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. Again, God saw all these things that the nations did to them. And instead of the nation of Israel asserting their own vengeance on these nations, God says, I'll protect you. This is something Israel knew. In Deuteronomy, before the people of Israel entered the land, the promised land, when Moses is, is going, re-going over the law and all the things of the Lord because it's a, now a new generation that's about to enter into the promised land than was there at the beginning at the time of the desert, 40 years before that. And so in Deuteronomy, you just have kind of a, you know, Moses goes over again the laws and all the different things. But one thing he makes very clear is that vengeance is for the Lord, that God would be their avenger, that they don't have to fight for themselves because they were about to enter a land that was occupied by enemies. And when they go into that land and they're scared and someone does something wrong to them and someone raids them, what Moses was saying, it's not up to you to fight for yourselves. But instead, I will avenge you. I will take care of you. And they saw that in the book of Joshua, right when they're about to enter into the problem, right when they're entering into their first battle. What happens? We have a, a Christophany, right? Where uh, a, a pre-incarnate Jesus, as some would say, the commander of the army of the Lord, and Joshua goes up to him and says, who are you for, us or our enemies? And he goes, neither, I'm for the Lord. There's a lot of people who are like, well, wouldn't he be for Israel? Why would he say that? Well, because if he said, well, if I'm, I'm for you guys, well, now he's in service to Israel rather than Israel being in service to him. And again, God throughout history has made that distinction with his people. He's not for us. We're for him. He's for himself. He's for his own glory. Jesus said that when he came. He goes, I'm not for my own glory. I'm for my father's glory. I came to do his will, not my will. That was the example Jesus set for us. But God would be their avenger. God would take care of them. God would protect them. And I think this would, even though we have a, <laughs> a pretty hefty chapter of a lot of destruction, desolation, Beasts of the field are going to be lying down. Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. Hissing in, in that culture in that time was, um, was you know, a, a pretty bad thing to do. <laughs> if you've ever been around cats, you know, when they hiss at you, they're obviously not saying hi to you. <laughs> they're saying, get away, don't touch me, don't look at me. And, uh, you know, you, they'll hiss at you and kind of say, you fool. But see, I think this should encourage us all that the Lord knows what is going on. Just like we saw in 2 Thessalonians 1, the Lord knows what's going on. He knows the trials and tribulations and persecutions. And in the end, right now it may not look even. Right now it may look like the, the wicked are prospering and the righteous are the ones suffering. 
And a lot of, a lot of biblical authors struggle with that themselves. You see that in the Psalms. Lord, why are you allowing the wicked to prosper? But one thing they would always look to is, you know what, they're prospering for a moment. But see, we get to prosper for eternity. That's what Christ promises us. That's what God is saying here to, to his nation. Look, they might be kind of pestering you now, but I will take care of them. I will take care of you. And we can see that this judgment that is coming on them will not just be a slap on the wrist, but it will be total destruction. Now chapter 3, starting in verse 1, he continues and he says, Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted, to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. Now, when we hear of the judgment of God, we can sometimes think, is that too harsh? Is that too much? Or undeserved? And I think the reason we think that way is because we compare, ourse- we compare them to other people or we compare ourselves to other people, right? We might look at uh, the judgment from God on someone and say, you know what? I, they're not that bad. I don't really think they deserve that. And it's because we're comparing them to some serial killer we saw on a TV show. And say, well, they're not that bad. I've seen worse, right? But notice what God does here. We compare ourselves to other people but God says we need to compare ourselves to him the Lord is righteous in our midst he will do unrighteousness every morning he brings his justice to light but the unjust knows no shame see we can always find someone worse and we can always find someone better but we are not judged according to anyone else's righteousness except the Lord's Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10, Therefore we make it our aim, whether at present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him, speaking of God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. And God's not going to put us up against each other. You know, round one, who's the, who's the winner? You know, it's not a bracket challenge to see who's the most righteous but it's everyone according to Christ. And we're either in Christ or outside of Christ. And if you're in Christ, then thank God it's not your work. But it's Christ's work. If you're outside of Christ, then it is your work that is judged and it will always fall short. Zephaniah says this again in verse 5 and God is not unrighteous in his judgment, even though we can think that. Um, but look, I mean, look at what the people are doing. He, he says it. They pollute, they're rebellious. They polluted the city. They've not obeyed his voice. Now he's speaking of his own people now. So he's just talked about the nations. Now he's going back to Jerusalem, going back to Israel and saying, look at what you guys are doing. If God's going to destroy these other nations, how much more so his people? He's going to judge these other nations. He's certainly not going to let his own people get away with sin. But they've rejected him. They're not doing what they should. And again, he doesn't compare them to the other nations. He says, you know, he doesn't say, oh, these nations. I mean, that's what happens in Habakkuk, right? When Habakkuk says, like, Lord, how could you use the Babylonians to judge us? Like, we're better than them. He goes, don't you worry. I'm still going to judge them. But I'm not going to judge them according to how good they were compared to you or bad they were compared to you. Again, he's judging them according to his own righteousness. 
Verse 6, he goes, I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. He's saying, you know, I punished all these other nations and I thought, hey, that would teach you a lesson. But that's not the case. Therefore, wait for me, verse 8, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord, to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride and shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. Nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Now Zephaniah, he's speaking there to Israel, but he's speaking of a a future event, a future event for even us. That one day the Lord will have his people to gather them together. He'll restore, look at verse 9, I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Obviously that hasn't happened yet today. That's not the case today. I think we could, uh, you know, we all could look out and see that. But that's spoken of in the future kingdom when Christ comes to reign on this earth. You know, he you know he says here, I restored to them peoples of pure language. Um, you know, God doesn't speak English necessarily. You know, that's not his. He, he can speak anything. Obviously, he can speak to anyone, but English isn't the main, you know, language of heaven. Instead, it's a pure language. There's no cuss words. You know, and actually, what's interesting in the Hebrew language, there are no cuss words. In Hebrew, they they kind of had to they in the actual language itself. There's no actual cuss words. Um, now I'm not saying that I I don't know if that's going to be the language that we speak. I you know there's many who believe that's the case. I don't know, but I thought that was interesting. But this is a yet future event when the Lord will return to judge the nations for their wickedness, but then also to restore his people. We've been seeing that in First and Second Thessalonians, that we as believers look forward to the Lord's coming because we know that he's coming back to rule, he's coming back to reign. To, he's coming back to restore us. But he's also coming back to judge the nations. Where he's going to make all things right. Because you can't have all things right if you continue to let sin run rampant. There has to be judgment. There has to be wrath poured out for that. It has to be taken out. But see, this is what we as believers have to look forward to. And these other nations that he speaks of, this is the world that one day will be crushed and that all will be left is God and his kingdom. Revelation speaks of the, the you know, it's pretty graphic, but it certainly gets the point across that the blood of his enemies will be up to the horse's bridle. No one will be able to withstand the Lord. And it's then, there'll be a day when we'll no longer endure hardship, suffering, or deal with sin. Isaiah speaks of how the young baby can put his hand in the pit of a viper and he's fine. He can lay down next to a lion and he's fine. Peace, right? That's what, that's what God brings. That's what Christ brings is peace. And one day he will literally bring peace to this earth. 
One thing he tells us that's not very encouraging, it's not the most encouraging thing to hear, but it's that until he returns, there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all these things. You know, it's interesting you hear the world talk about the year we've had in 2020, all the stuff that's going on, and they all, it could have get worse. This person's died, or that nation's now going to war, and this thing's happened, and that thing's happened. And to them, they're like, well, can't we get relief? And as believers, as much as we want to say, it'd be nice to get relief. Unfortunately, that's not the case because sinful man is still running rampant. But see, as a promise to, to God's people, is that one day this won't be the case. Verse 13, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. And then verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cut out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will bring you back, even at the time that I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Now, here Zephaniah really ends the prophecy with a bunch of great promises. I mean, he's just, throughout the book, he's, he's been saying utter and complete destruction and desolation, and he's been about these other nations, and then he's telling Jer the Israel that God's going to judge you as well for your unrighteousness. But again, one thing, when you read prophecy with the Lord is, it's never just doom and gloom for those who are found in Christ, for those who are God's people. It's never just doom and gloom. In fact, in the New Testament, we're told that chastening from the Lord is a good thing when the Lord chastens us. Because when He chastens us, it shows that we're one of His children. If we're not His children, then He's not chastening us. And the reason that He chastens us is to make us more like Him. So that way we would grow. Quite frankly, that's what God was doing with Israel. Chastening them. Trying to cause them to follow him. We know Israel's history. They're not great at remembering their past very well. <laughs> right? Read the book of Judges. It's just a cycle. They forsake the Lord. They cry out to him. They go into captivity. They cry out to him. He saves them. They forsake the Lord. They go into captivity, they cry out to him, he saves them, they forsake, it's just constant, constant, constant. And then in the times of the kings, if they had a king that served the Lord, well, the people served the Lord for the most part, at least on the outside. But God was always trying to bring them back to him. And, and what he says here is that one day that will finally happen. I will gather you, I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes. Right? The, the people of Israel were constantly being taken captive, constantly outside of their land, constantly, and it's, it's all because of their sin, right? And because of sin, we have also been separated from Christ. He had to come in and, and reconcile us, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, reconcile us back to God. And right now, as we're here on this earth, we're foreigners, we're strangers. But one day he's going to bring us back into his land to be with him. 
when we'll see all this. No more sin, no more pain, no more suffering. We don't have to be afraid. That's the promise of the Lord glorifying and, and redeeming his people. And, and I think as we close tonight, I think as the Lord's people, we should be encouraged that the Lord will never forsake us. Just like he never did Israel. Just like he hasn't done for Israel. He won't forsake them. And he hasn't forsaken us. He cares for his, for his people and he'll defend his people. He knows what's going on. He knows what we're going through. He knows the persecutions or the trials that we might be enduring. And he'll bring justice. And he'll fight for our sake. We don't have to fight for ourselves. We don't need to avenge ourselves. But the Lord will do it for us. And I think the last encouragement I would have for anyone listening, and if you're listening and you don't know the Lord, is as he, he, we started this out in chapter 2, you right now have a chance to repent, to turn to Him. He's giving you this warning right now. I mean, He could, he could and he, had every, he would have every right to just, right, lightning bolt down from heaven, zap you right there. That's what you deserve. But he's giving you an opportunity to respond, to turn to him. So Lord, we thank you that you've, you've for those of us who are saved tonight, you gave us that opportunity. And, and for most of us, you gave us multiple opportunities. And we finally answered your call, Lord. We finally turned to you. We finally looked to you. And so Lord, we thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we, we look forward um, eagerly look forward to that future where one day we'll be free from pain and suffering and we won't, need fe we won't have fear anymore. Lord, but we'll have you. We'll be in your midst, Lord. You'll be ruling over us in your righteousness, Lord. But Lord, you, you caused us to be part of that kingdom here on this earth right now. We're ambassadors for Christ, for, for your kingdom, as we're here on this earth, Lord. So let us right now live in your righteousness, walk in your righteousness. Lord, according to what your word has said. Lord, let us be a people that trusts in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.